Today we will be talking about realism in cinema. This lecture will be a little bit abstract. So I'll try to help you understand what I'm talking about. When we think about realism in movies, one way to think about it is could it happen in real life? So this is realism or uh, realism versus fantasy. Right? <clears throat> is this our world? That's not what we're going to be talking about today. Another way to think about realism is. Is the story realistic? Does it make sense? Usually if the answer is no, uh, people think that it is not a good movie. That is also not what we're going to be talking about today. In between these two, right? Is it our world or is it a fantasy world on one hand? On the other hand, does it make sense or does it not make sense? In between these two, there is a question that we will be talking about today, which is. Are we part of this world? Or are we just looking at this world? In other words, when we watch this film, does it feel like this could be our world? Or does the film keep us away and outside and we're only looking at people performing a story in an artificial environment? That is the kind of realism that I want to talk to you about today. Um, most of the films that we have been watching this semester have been realist in this sense. The few exceptions are not the fantasy movies. Uh, for example, uh, in Twilight, the situation is ridiculous and fantastical, but we understand how Bella feels. We understand maybe less, but we still kind of understand how Edward feels. The world, it feels like we have been brought into that world. It could, if like uh, Edward really existed and vampires and werewolves and whatever, it feels like if those things were real, this world could exist. <clears throat> or in Constantine, it's the same issue. Uh, there are so many fantasy elements. But if we accept that these elements do exist, like if we think that they exist, then that world feels like it. that's how it should feel. Right, it brings us into that story world. <clears throat> so the less realist films that we have seen this semester are one of them is Bound. When we watch that film, there's nothing fantastical about that film. Everything in that world could exist already in our world. But when we watch that film, it doesn't feel like we have been brought into that world. It feels like we're watching things happen to people. And however we feel about that film comes not from any kind of identification, tong, any kind of vicarious experience, Our feelings about that film come from the arrangement of the situation. Like, what is the danger for these characters? What might the bad guys do? How will they get out of this situation? It's a more abstract, we might say less subjective kind of story presented to us. The other less realist film that we have seen so far is the film we watched during the first week, Day for Night. Now, everything in that film could and in fact did happen. Um, because the director 
took elements from his own life as a filmmaker to create the story for that film. But again, when we're watching that film, we don't get a sense that uh, this could be us, like we are part of that world. We are simply watching situations happen to people. Uh, and our feelings about this film arise from the ridiculous situations, from the unreasonable requests of the actors. Uh, we're not joining the characters. We're looking at them from outside. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, if I explained that clearly enough. Do you kind of understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> Right. Um, so think about a general comedy. We haven't been watching a lot of comedy in this course so far. Uh, but when you go out and you watch a comedy film, uh, things are funny, people do funny things, they say funny things, but we often don't feel like, you know, those people are maybe our friends. We don't really care too much about them. So, for example, uh, when we watch Slapstick, which is a kind of comedy where people like uh, fall down, run into things, get hurt, but it's a comedy. Why is that funny? When someone falls down in real life, we say, oh my gosh, are you OK? Are you hurt? We worry about them. So when we watch this kind of thing happen in a comedy, why don't we care about the characters? Why do we laugh at them? And it's because that kind of comedy is not realist in the sense we're talking about here. That kind of movie sets the audience outside of the story. It's like uh, looking at uh, like looking at cats and dogs running around, right? If you think about the inner world of a dog as it's chasing a cat, right? It's full of like energy, adrenaline, sen 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 su, maybe even like anxiety. But when we look at them running around, it just looks cute and funny and adorable. We don't really think about how, for example, the cat is feeling being chased by a dog. Uh, it's afraid for its life. It's trying to uh, get away. And then if, for example, the cat makes it to safety somewhere high, like in a tree, and it looks back down on the dog, it's feeling a sense of arrogance, triumph and victory. But we never think about that. We just we, to us, we're just looking at animals running around. That is the difference between uh, being part of a world or just looking at a world. Realism and irrealism. Uh, does that is that better? Mm, little bit. It okay, be, so uh, it's an unreal world. It's mm, opposite. Right. Okay. Right. So uh, this this separation between realism and irrealism is not just in the cinema, right? Any kind of story that we read, any kind of story that we hear, there is this same separation. Are you allowed into the world of the characters or are you simply looking at the characters and the story from outside? So today the, the main topic I wanted to talk to you about is how do you create this kind of realism? As I'm sure you all know, if you try to write a composition or a story or an essay, and you simply write down what happened, uh, who did what, it doesn't feel real, 
right? It just feels like you're listing events and people. So how do you create realism? How do you bring your reader or your viewer into the world of the story? I think the main point is you have to give the viewer in terms of movies, you have to give the viewer somebody that they can identify with. In other words, this character that you choose, you will tell the story from the perspective of that character. We know that when something happens and there's more than one person, there's more than one perspective, right? This person's looked at it this way, the other person understood it the other way. If you don't pay enough attention to this question of perspective, then one event will be told from one perspective, another event will be told from another perspective. You might even accidentally tell this story from your own perspective, even though you're not part of the story. So the perspective of the director. And when you put these different perspectives together into one story or film, there is therefore no way for the viewer to find a solid entryway into the story. There's no single approach. If they try to follow the story along with character A, and the next scene is told from the perspective of character B, they have to start over again. They have to reassemble the story. They have to try to make sense again of what is happening. If you tell the whole story from the director's perspective, then the viewer will have no way into the story at all. They will si simply be like the director sitting behind the viewing monitor, looking at what the camera has captured. Like watching a play, a stage play. One of the main differences I think between a stage play and a film. I think I, I talked to you guys about this before is that there is the separation of the screen. Right when you watch a play, you feel that you are in the same space as the actors. But the other main difference is that because film depends on a camera, you always have to think about perspective. From what angle, whose angle, whose subjective viewpoint are you telling the story? Think about two characters talking to each other. In a stage play, it's just two people on stage talking to each other. But in a film, first you get a shot of one person. Then you get a reverse shot of the other person. Then you come back to the first person. Every shot follows some kind of perspective. So if you don't pay close enough attention to this point, you will not be able to let your viewer in. And this would result in a let's say emotionally blunt story. 就是这故事的情感上会比较粗糙. You don't uh, you aren't able to really understand the characters, whether it's the person whose perspective you have chosen or the characters that this person looks at, interacts with, talks to, tries to understand. The, the most simple way to say this is that when you start something, you have to start somewhere. When you begin a story, you, you don't only have to choose when to begin, you also have to choose where to begin. Out of the so many people in this story, which person or people are you following? <clears throat> So the clearest example of this uh, from a film that we have seen in this course is probably Underwater. The story begins with one character. And then slowly as she moves through the underwater drilling station, she collects other characters. 
uh, and most of these are supporting characters. Uh, but then she meets the captain. And the captain, of course, is the most important person in inside the world of the story. So anytime the captain is in a scene, he will also seem very important. Uh, but when we pay attention to scenes where both the captain and the main character played by Kristen Stewart are in the same scene, usually there's also other people in the scene and this, the perspective is as a team following a captain. But when they're walking underwater, you can't see everybody at the same time. That's part of the design of the film is the visual obstacles. And so we go back to focusing on our main character. She's not the most important person inside the world of the story, but this is the person, this is the character that the film has chosen to let us identify with. And through her perspective, we enter the world of the story. So even though underwater has a sea monster and they drill to like, it's like science fiction and fantasy, but the way that the story is told is realist in the sense that we're talking about here. <clears throat> So once you have chosen the perspective of the film, then you have to figure out, OK, you have these things that you want to say. You have these events that you want to put together into a story. How do you make these events all appear from the same perspective that you have chosen? Uh, of course, you don't have to use only one perspective for the entire film. You can have uh, one section from this character's perspective, another section from another character's perspective. But each section, uh, the entire section, you have to design carefully. Instead of like jumping around because you don't know what you're doing, you have to be very conscious about which character are you following now. How do they see the events? What do these events mean to that character? And if you switch to another person's perspective, you have to rethink these questions for that section also. Uh, so one example of this is in Bound. We have two main characters. We begin from the perspective of Corky. She moves in, she does like the house renovations. Uh, and then she meets Violet. But after they begin their plan, most of the plan. Is told from the perspective of Violet because she's the one who's manipulating the men. She's the one who's uh, trying to direct the events of the film. So that film has two perspectives and we uh, switch from one to the other. The switch makes sense. You can't tell the whole story from Corky's point of view because for most of the plan, she's not inside the room. But also the inside the room, when you have Violet and you have Caesar, it's very clear that we're viewing these events from Violet's point of view. Uh, when we look at Caesar, we understand his behavior through the information that Corky has analyzed with Violet, right? When they're planning uh, what to do, Corky tells Violet, oh, Caesar will probably do this. Caesar will probably do that. And so when Caesar does do this and do that, we're not focused on how he thinks and he feels. Instead, we're focused on how much his behavior fits the plan. And the person who knows about the plan inside the room is Violet. So the film has organized events so that we're more identified with one character than another. This is a good use of perspective. It's a clear perspective for the audience. 
So when Caesar goes off the plan, right? He goes right. He he drags Violet to uh, I think his name was Sonny. Johnny, Johnny, when he drags Violet to Johnny's house, right to look for the money, that's not part of the plan. So when we watch that scene, we're not thinking about how worried Caesar is, how frantic Zhao Lu he is. We're thinking about how does Violet feel? Right, this is not part of the plan. Is she safe? Will will she make it back out? Uh, and yet within. This film, even though there are clear perspectives. Uh, we're focused actually on the plan, right? Corky and Violet and especially for the long middle part of the film. They are most important to us because they are the people who understand the plan. We don't have too much insight into who they are as people aside from the plan. We know that they love each other, but that's about it. Uh, so even in a less realist film like Bound, you still have different degrees of realism depending on use of perspective. So what does it look like when this kind of uh, effort to create realism fails? I would say that an example of this would be Day for Night. Day for Night also does not feel very realist because the, the point of the film is to show you all the different techniques that filmmakers use to make a film. But I think that the director tried to make it more realist. He gave us a human interest storyline, right? Alphonse, the the lead actor, uh, is like struggling with love. He loves the script girl, but then she dumps him. Uh, and then uh, the lead actress tries to comfort him and they end up in bed together and it's a big mess. So we do have a storyline with people in the center that I think we were supposed to care about. But because the film is so focused on the making of a film, when we look at what happens to the actors, uh, we're more focused on the idea of what will this do to the film? Can they still finish the film? Will they have to change actors? Will they go over budget and run out of money? And only as a secondary concern do we think about uh, will the actress, uh, will her marriage survive this event? Uh, what about the relationships between the different actors and the director? We care less about that. Uh, and I think it's because when we see the story of Alphonse, uh, and Julie, it's not told straight through, right? We have one section here, and then we go back to making the movie, and then we have another section there, and then we go back to making the movie. So the perspective is is there, but it's not very clear. It's not very strong. That results in uh, a less impactful realism. We're not exactly let into the inner world of the story. Instead, we're thinking about will this story work out in the end? Uh, and then of course you have to think about the ending. So many movies with good ideas that start off good uh, end up with a bad ending. And by bad ending, I mean that it loses whatever realism it previously had. Um, so, for example, some good endings to films we have seen this semester uh, include like the ending of Twilight. That ending is still focused on the inner world of Bella and Edward. The ending of Constantine. It's still focused on uh, the character of Constantine and what he will do 
uh, how he feels about his life. Now that he has been like rescued and healed, what will he do with the rest of his life? Less realist endings include the ending of Underwater. If you remember that ending, uh, Kristen Stewart's character sacrifices herself uh, by blowing up the drilling station, but it kills the what kills the realism at the very end is when she looks into the camera. There is no reason to look into the camera in that story. We've been following her throughout the events of the film. Uh, we've been on her side. We're inside the story world. At the very end, when she looks into the camera, that actually jolts us back out of the story world. It kills whatever realism the film had worked so hard to establish. If we compare that ending to the ending of Personal Shopper, where Kristen Stewart's character also looks into the camera at the very end, the reason that Personal Shopper's uh, last moments don't kill its realism is because the entire story has been about is there something outside of this world, right? Ghosts, spirits. So even inside that story world, the characters are thinking about and are aware of something outside of that world. So when Kristen Stewart's character looks into the camera, it takes us outside of the story world, yes, but because the film has been talking about what is outside this world, we are not thrown back into our own world as the viewer. We're thrown into the possible outside world of the story world, which is the world of spirits and ghosts. Uh, 当然是因为他是灵界超现实所以这些人物是没办法直接去体认到观察到但是他们设想说这个外界存在所以当最后一幕 被放置在那个外界，而不是回到我们自己的现实界。我不知道这样有没有有没有听懂。它等于是有先铺好路了。And of course, what really helps the ending is that it does not end when she looks into the camera. After she looks into the camera, she looks away again, and we are once again back inside the story world. Uh, especially in storytelling, people often like to try to wrap things up, to tie together loose ends, to give good guys happy endings and bad guys bad endings. But if this kind of ending is forced, if it's not built organically from the film that we have just finished watching, right? If the ending is not because the characters uh, naturally will end like this, but because the filmmaker wants to create this kind of ending, it will often feel uh, forced and even uh, irrealist or even unrealistic. Of course, when we get to uh, like if it's a minor fault, it might just feel irrealist but if it's a major fault like it was completely added on with no support it might even stop making sense uh, and that's when you get uh and films with bad endings Lanway. and so this is why i began this lecture talking about on the one hand fantasy and realistic worlds on the other hand does the story make sense or not 
because our question of realism and irrealism is in between these two. If there's uh, too much fantasy that is like the focus of the film instead of the emotional effects of that fantasy, then it's irrealist. If the realism is distorted or forced away at the end, then on the other side, it doesn't make sense. So the question of realism and irrealism really is a question of audience experience. If you want to make a movie that puts the audience outside of the story world, usually those films will be will have a faster pace, will have more spectacle or excitement uh, to keep us engaged and paying attention to the story. But if you give the audience a way in, a perspective and a realism, you can slow down, you can give more details, uh, you can be more intimate and quiet, because the audience has already been let in. Uh, and you don't have to worry about uh, the audience, like whether they will drift away or not. Um, it's like catching a bird. If the bird is outside of the cage, like maybe like it's standing on your head or it's standing nearby, you always have to worry about will the bird fly away? And so you do things to entertain the bird and keep it there. But if the bird flies into the cage and you shut the door of the cage, well, let's not shut the door. Let's say you, it flies into the cage. Then even though the door is open and the bird could leave, it's much less likely. They've already agreed to enter the cage and there's the, the bird is sitting there or I guess standing there quietly. Uh, and that kind of. Bird is a metaphor for the audience. If you let the audience in and they are willing to enter into the realism of the story world, it's much less likely they will want to leave Unless you sh you fuck things up and for example, like you shake the bird cage and you scare the bird or you give the bird something that it doesn't want to eat or something, right? Then the bird will want to leave. But it's two different ways of telling stories. Does that make sense? Or was that Do you have questions? No. OK, so uh, you may have noticed next week's theme is irrealism. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, the similar question, but from the opposite perspective. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about today is documentary. Um, most people, when they think of documentary, they think that, oh, this is a movie that will tell us about something that happened. That's not always true. Think about it like this. If making a movie is like writing an essay, most movies are fictional and it's like you're uh, telling a fictional story, like you're writing a short story or a novel. Documentaries are like essays, Sanwen. Most people think of essays as true, but really the definition of an essay is not fiction. When you read an essay, you expect that there is some kind of truth in this story, but if the author changes some details or skips over some details, we think it's fine. The same is true for documentary. We expect that it is about something that happens in the real world. But we also um, are fine if the documentary chooses to 
uh, ignore some details or skip over some details. This tells us that documentary is not defined by how true it is. Documentary is defined by the audience's expectations. A documentary that feels like it's telling a fictional story would not be a good documentary, even if the story that it tells is 100% true. But if we finish watching, uh, like if I show you a, a film and I don't tell you that it's a documentary and you don't think it's a documentary, then it's we can say that it's not really a documentary, even if what everything it says is 100% true. So when we talk about documentary, we can think about how does the form of a documentary determine the story of the documentary? Uh, so let's assume for now that we have on our hands a documentary about something that actually did happen, that it is not propaganda, it is not lying to us. The filmmaker has not misunderstood the situation or the facts. So we assume that this is a truthful documentary. Now, in making any film, in writing any story, you have to choose what to use and what to leave out. When it's a fictional story, it's easier to let go of things because everything is made up, right? The, the author or the filmmaker or the writer thought up every part of the story. But in a documentary, you have to consider which details can be left out and not affect the story, how the audience will think about this story. So this is not just about like telling a good news story and like you have both sides, you have the whole picture. This is also about uh, which facts from the real events have to be part of your motivation for telling this story. If we simply wanted to learn what happened, we can read the news. We watch a documentary because we want to discover and explore what happened. So it's not just giving us the facts. You have to think about how do we present this information? What information do we present? Uh, and also the question, whose perspective should we take? Um, in most important historical events, there's more than one person. So when you make a documentary, this is still a film. You still should choose which person to follow into the story so that the audience is willing to continue to learn about this situation. Now, when I say what should you leave in, what should you take out? It sounds like you have re the documentary filmmaker has recorded everything. And you simply have to choose, pick and choose. But really, most documentaries are not made like that. Think about it. You cannot predict future history. How do you know that this thing will be important? How do you know when you should be recording things with your camera? You can't record 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You're, yeah, at, le at least you have to change batteries. You yourself have to rest and plan. You're still making a movie. Making movies, as you know, takes a lot of time and energy and money. So you, it looks like you kind of have to know when to uh, record and when you can put down your camera which of course is impossible. If you're really capturing events as they happen, it's impossible for you to know this. So usually people make a documentary by uh, 
focus, like finding a topic that is worth uh, promoting or spreading information about. And then for most parts of the documentary, they do what are called reenactments. Uh, they find the person involved in the story and they ask this person to perform what happened when the important thing happened. Uh, a very simple ex uh, example of this is like uh, when you watch a news report, not like uh, a simple news report, but like one of those hour long news reports or like 10 or 15 minute long news reports on TV. For example, um, Taiwanese news channels really love to introduce restaurants. So you're watching a 10 minute piece uh, introducing a restaurant. You will always have one shot of the restaurant owner like cutting vegetables or like stirring the soup or something. Those shots all happen because the TV crew asks the restaurant owner to perform this action. If you've ever been in the kitchen of a restaurant, you'll know that there's no way in hell it could fit a TV crew into the SOP of the restaurant. Restaurant kitchens are some of the busiest places in the world. Noisy, loud, uh, smelly, steamy, busy, no way a television crew could fit into that world. So those shots are all reenactments. This applies also to like historical documentaries. Uh, sometimes uh, the filmmaker will hire actors to play the real people in the past and ask them to perform uh, whatever important thing happened in the past. Now, if the events are far enough back in the past, we know that these are reenactments, right? The original people are long dead. This could not be real. But even for films uh, about recent events, the filmmaker may ask the main people in those events to perform what happened what they did during those events and some documentary filmmakers will try to make those events look as uh, as real as possible as if the filmmaker really was capturing these events at that time it gives us the sense of truth it gives us the sense of being there even though it's a reenactment also. A similar logic applies to when in a documentary, the filmmaker interviews people, right? If you've seen a documentary, they will always get some expert. You will have like a title at the bottom of the screen. This is his name or her name. This is what they do. Uh, and the interviews will often be intercut with images, right? So you have when the interview begins, you have a shot of the expert and they're talking. And then while they're talking, the film will cut away to an image of what they're talking about. And then uh, at the end of that part of the interview, we will cut back to the expert and they finish talking. Seems normal, right? Seems OK, but really. Why does the film cut away from the interview to show us something else? There are two main reasons. You may not have thought of the second reason. The first reason obviously is because it's more boring to look at someone talk and it's more interesting to see an image. After all, we're watching a movie. We're not reading a news report. But the second reason is because if we're not looking at the expert, the filmmaker can do some tricky stuff with the sound. The filmmaker may uh, cut 
some parts of the interview audio away to make the interview make more sense. They might cut away the spaces, the pauses between words and sentences to make the interview go faster. If we can't see the person, we don't know how real to life the sound of the interview is. That is the key principle behind documentary filmmaking. You tell a story that is supposed to be true, but you want to make it feel more true using the techniques of filmmaking. So the question of realism is at the center of documentary. How do you like if you if you've ever read someone's diary, you know that reading direct events directly as they happen often does not feel real. So how do you use the techniques of filmmaking to make the truth feel real? It's the central question of documentary. Now, once in a while, you will have a documentary where the filmmaker knows that something important is going to happen. So they're prepared and they're recording and they actually manage to capture the thing as it happens. How do they do it? One way is maybe that event is the climax of a longer series of events. So it's predictable that this kind of important thing will happen. But you also have documentaries where the filmmaker themselves is uh, affecting and influencing the events so that it's, they're not just chasing the truth, they're also helping to bring the truth to their camera. One example is the film we will be watching today, Citizen Four. Citizen Four tells the story of Edward Snowden, a whistleblower at the National Security Agency of the United States. And uh, he learns that the US government is basically spying on everybody. We know this now only because he told the world. How did he tell the world? First, he fled to Hong Kong away from the US. Then he called in a journalist and a documentary filmmaker and told them he had something important to tell them. So in this situation, the documentary filmmaker was prepared and she was able to capture everything that Snowden says and all the information that he gives the world as he did it. That's why this documentary, and of course it's an important issue, so that's why this documentary won the Oscar the next year. Okay, do you have questions about documentary? No. Okay, thank you. Oh, good. Uh, so let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, when we come back, uh, please watch the film Citizen Four. <laughs> 